Thank you very much, Nicola, and welcome to this uh, session, which I hope will be an insight into uh, how you might be able to work towards improving uh, your writing. And I know that we have a broad range of uh, participants today, current students, potential students, past students, probably a few colleagues also um, in, in the session as well. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I will uh, begin. Can, can you just let me know? I, occasionally, I will ask for um, uh, signals that you can hear me and see me. Uh, and, and Nicola, I can see that. Can you see me and hear me? Excellent. Because there's nothing worse than carrying on and then realizing that no one can actually see me or hear me. It's a little bit disconcerting because, of course, I can't see the audience at all. So I'm sort of speaking into a void, but that's fine because this is about writing and how we can improve our writing. So this is what today's session is going to be about. Uh, we will be looking uh, at how we might avoid the pitfalls of bad writing. Uh, I think it is the case that very, very few people can naturally write well. It's something that you have to um, nurture. It's a skill that you have to develop. But I think we can all very readily uh, improve our writing if, if we know what the pitfalls of bad writing are. If we can spot them and we can start to correct them, okay, we, we, not, we may not be able to write really well, but at least we can avoid writing really badly. I'll also be looking at how we might structure an essay uh, to improve uh, the way in which we're getting across our message. Uh, and I'll also, as part of that, look at the writing process, how we can draft our writing and redraft our writing. I'll give some top tips on uh, how we might be able to do that. But we're going to uh, start off with an awareness test uh, that I hope will prove to us all that we're awake and we're listening and paying attention. And I want you to focus, I'm going to share with you an awareness test. Uh, your job is to look at the, uh, at the white team. I'm going to show you a video in which there are two teams of people with two basketballs and they're going to be passing the ball to each other. So the whites are going to be passing the ball to everyone in the white and the black team are going to be passing the ball to the black team. Your job, to make it very clear, is to look at the white team, ignore the black team, look at the white team and see how many times the white team passed the ball between each other. I hope we're all fairly clear on that. I'm now going to share uh, that video for you. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, see, uh, just set this up. Can I have a sign that you can see that, Nicola? Is that, is yeah, that, that is perfect. Okay, okay. so uh, just to repeat the instructions, although I think I have a, a, a friendly narrator um, who, will, who will do that for you, you've got to look to see how many times the white team passes the ball and count them, and then we'll do a poll to see how many people are paying attention. Here we go. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! Okay, are we all still still with us? How many do colleagues think? Uh, oh, I can see the poll. This is fantastic. This is real. Look at that. Real interactive. Uh, 13 is, uh, I could do this like a horse racing thing, couldn't I? 13 seems to be favourite, but 12 is also, oh, good Lord, 31% 30, 30, people think it's 13. 9% think it's 14. Very few people think it's more than that. And quite a few people, 25%, think it's 10 passes. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, I, I'll give a few. There's quite a few people, isn't there? 252. Good Lord. Right. Okay. It, it's, it's evening out now. I, I think quite a few people might be confused because there's only one right answer, uh, and I'll reveal what that answer is. 
Uh, let, let's continue with the video if I can find the right control. Where has it gone? My control seemed to have disappeared. Are you okay? There we go. Yep. Okay. The answer is 13. Ah. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So the, the point there, uh, by the way, did anyone else see the moonwalking bear? How many people saw the moonwalking bear? Can we have a quick, uh, a quick show of hands? How many people saw that moonwalking bear? Because only 28% of people got it right. So people were looking uh, for the passers. 28% of people got that right, 13 some were confused and only counted 10 or 11 or 12. A few people saw 15 passes, which is quite interesting, must have, must have counted a couple of black ones. But um, the, the, the point here is that there was also a moonwalking bear uh, striding through the middle, and I don't think many people would have seen that. This is a psychological test which demonstrates that it's very easy to overlook something that you're not looking for. If you're focused on, on something uh, and you, you're not aware of other things within what you're doing, uh, you can very easily um, uh, not, not spot something that you're, you're, you're not looking for. So in the case of uh, writing an essay, let me just go back to the PowerPoint. When you're writing uh, an essay and you're writing uh, away, you, you won't be uh, aware of, let me go back to awareness test. So, so the awareness test shows us that, that you might uh, overlook uh, uh, certain things if, you, if you're not uh, watching out for them. So when we're writing an essay, uh, for a deadline especially, uh, the focus is getting it done, writing it. Um, filling the page with writing uh, and reaching the word count. And when we're under pressure, uh, we tend to write quickly and, and quite badly. Uh, we need to avoid this. Uh, it's good to make a start. It's, it's okay. It's perfectly okay to write quickly and get ideas down. Uh, that's great. It's far better than the alternative, which is writer's block, when you're overthinking absolutely everything uh, to, to such an extent that you can't even write something down. So it's, it's good to get it all out, but you'll be writing very quickly and you won't be focusing on the moonwalking bears of bad writing. So everything that you write when, you, when you're getting it down should be considered uh, an early draft. So that the faculty, uh, the, the examiners, the teachers, uh, the external examiners and, and people that are scrutinizing your writing, they will be looking out for bad writing. They will see the moonwalking bears in your writing. So we need to see, we need to recognize them and, and watch out for them because they do importantly distract and they weaken your, your arguments. So what this webinar about essentially in this session, what I hope we'll do is increase your awareness of uh, these moonwalking bears of poor writing so that we can recognize them and then with practice we can eliminate them and your writing will improve and eventually start to shine. So let's start with a new overview of what these uh, moonwalking bears uh, are of bad writing. But before I uh, go into that, I just want to explain this slide that you can see now, reading for a degree. Uh, when we're studying for a degree, we're not passively absorbing knowledge from lecturers and from sources of information. We're, we're actually uh, reading as many sources as we can, uh, and there is a correlation between uh, reading and writing. The more reading you do, uh, and, and if you're reading the right stuff, 
um, you will be able to uh, also enhance your writing skills. So today we're going to look at elements of bad writing that you need to avoid, how to spot them, uh, but, but we'll, we'll also, uh, I want to make the point very briefly that you also need to read as much as possible because when we're reading, uh, hopefully we're picking up um, good habits of, of how we might write. I'm not suggesting we copy people, but uh, the more reading you do, the, the, there is, as I said, this positive correlation between how much reading you do and how your writing uh, improves. So what are the moonwalking bears then of, uh, of poor writing? Well, I'll, I'll briefly go through them now, uh, bullet by bullet. The first one is redundancy. Very briefly, that's where you're writing things that really add no value whatsoever, that it's fairly meaningless, it's padding. Uh, we want to get rid of that. Pomposity, very briefly, that's where you are writing in a way multi-syllabic, complex language uh, that sounds very clever, but, but will actually, if you overuse it, uh, might actually get in the way of getting your message across. Uh, slang is something that I've noticed is, uh, is um, on the increase. People use slang when they're writing, so they're writing as they would speak. The next one is repetition. Uh, quite often we find that students will get a good idea, they'll write it down and they think, oh, that was good, that felt good, I'll, I'll write it again in a slightly different way, but they're actually repeating themselves. So we want to avoid repetition. The next one is uh, absurdity. That's where we're writing things that we think actually make sense, but when you reread them in your redraft, they actually don't make any sense at all. And ambiguity. It's, it's closely related to absurdity. Ambiguity is where you're writing something that could be read in two different ways. And if your reader reads it in the wrong way, then it doesn't really make sense or it gives the wrong meaning. It could be read in the wrong way. And finally, uh, misprints, where you're typing so fast you you <laughs> type something that isn't quite right. So I'll give examples of all of these various um, things that we should be avoiding. Very briefly, just to say also um, things that I won't be covering today, uh, because I don't want uh, people to sort of be hanging on to get top tips on things like referencing uh, and how to cover grammar and things like that. I won't be covering that today at all, maybe in, a, in another uh, seminar we might explore those nor will I be looking at the rather complex area of punctuation and how to punctuate uh, things properly um, again that might be something that we uh, that we look at uh, in another session so the first moonwalking bear then is redundancy uh, I'm, I'm going to use today just to give a, a bit of background uh, I'm going to use wherever possible today examples from my own writing um, uh, and this, this example I'm about to show you is from 1986, when I was an undergraduate student at Sheffield University, studying for my first degree, which was in prehistory and archaeology. So wherever possible today, I'll, I'll use uh, examples in today's webinar. Uh, so some of them, uh, apologies if you're bored by archaeology, but they will revolve around my experience as both a student and a faculty member and indeed an external examiner studying, teaching and researching archaeology. But the subject here is irrelevant. It's the aspect of written style and structure that I want us to focus on. Uh, and these aspects are applicable to almost any subject area. So don't get carried away by the, by the archaeology interesting and absorbing, although that is, of course. So uh, redundancy, the importance of redundancy and, and how to spot it and eliminate redundancy uh, is, is also a very important skill because it will save you words. We often overshoot word limits uh, and we feel it's impossible to uh, reduce the word count. We, we often have a target number that we're aiming for and we overshoot it. We think, oh no, how am I going to cut that down? I've put lots of effort into this. Uh, especially dissertations and thesis and bigger pieces of work. Nine times out of 10, this isn't the case. Uh, almost all people have 
quite a bit of redundancy in their first draft. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, a piece of my writing, one of the first essays that I wrote when I was uh, uh, quite a bit younger in 1986. So um, let's consider this as an example. So I want you now to read through this and have a look and see what you think. I thought it was quite good, obviously, when I wrote this and I handed it in and thought, oh, I'm really pleased with myself. This looks really quite good. I wrote, it is a reasonable conclusion to suggest that hunter-gatherer societies need to maintain a nomadic lifestyle. In this essay, it has been demonstrated, for example, that the impact of the group needs to be carried by the environment in which the hunter-gatherer group are living. It is assumed that this is achieved and, and, and it went on. That's 55 words there. So how do we, how do we start to, to break this down so that we can recognize uh, redundancy? Well, here is a, a, a top tip, and that is that redundant clauses normally have um, a, uh, a word in, uh, and that word normally is associated with groups of other words which represent clutter and baggage uh, and unnecessary words and phrases that clog up uh, the writing. Uh, and that word is that. Uh, I'm just going to highlight the that. There we are. There are three of them. So when we're, when we're going through our writing, we, this is a draft. I handed this in and I got quite a poor mark. I was really disappointed. Um, had I have done what I'm about to tell you, I would have made my writing much clearer, and much sharper and much more focused. And indeed, my lecturer scrawled all over it and gave me this top tip that I'm going to pass on to you. So you highlight the that's, and then you see that the words around them are, are largely redundant phrases. So if you want to polish your writing, you simply remove the redundancy from around that. So let's have a look to see what that looks like. I'm now going to highlight in black the redundant phrases. They're not all associated with the word that, but th in three cases they are. So there it is. It is a reasonable conclusion. It is reasonable. Well, you know, it's not a motive. Why am I writing that? that that's completely redundant. To suggest that is redundant. In this essay, it has been demonstrated, for example, well, the reader knows that because they they know it's an essay, they're reading it. You don't need to tell them it's an essay. In which the hunter-gatherer group are living, it is assumed that the, these are all redundant phrases. So 28 words of what I wrote down there are in fact redundant. If I cut them out and rewrite to accommodate those deletions, it looks like that. In conclusion, hunter-gatherer societies need to maintain a nomadic lifestyle for several important reasons. Firstly, the impact of the group needs to be carried by the environment. This is achieved, et cetera, et cetera. So now the writing has no excess baggage in it, uh, and, and it is less waffly, it's more direct, it's sharper, and it has more authority. And most importantly, you've saved 43% of space in which to write more important things that are going to keep the teacher or the examiner or the faculty member ticking. So if you get rid of the excess baggage, you get rid of the redundancy, you have more clear writing uh, and the, reflex, the tick reflex of your teacher is marking this is going to go into overdrive and it, it leaves a, a better impression. So that's the first moonwalking there. Let's look at the next one. Oh, uh, just a brief example of a redundant road sign. Pomposity. Uh, pomposity. Uh, is, is a, uh, as I mentioned earlier in a brief definition, is, is where the writer is using excessively long and complicated words. Uh, I'll show you an example. Uh, before we read the example, um, th this is a very good example of a style of writing that emerged uh, in the wake of philosophical changes related to how we understand knowledge. 
that happened uh, at the end of uh, World War II. And it was an almost global phenomenon. And it led to an elitist uh, style of writing, which many people have criticized as being deliberately uh, exclusive. It was, it was evolved deliberately to exclude people. Only those people with an expensive, privileged university education were able to read this nonsense. Uh, let's read it. The operation of simultaneous locational determinative, redictational and status analytical programs relative to primary source material data retrieval, contributive to reconstructive syntheses of pre-current social cultural entities, that, that, that can be summarized by one word. And bearing in mind my background, does anyone want to share with us what that might mean? It's just one word and it's related to archaeology. Can anyone in the chat write what they think that might be? Have we got any answers? I can see there are some raised hands, but uh, I, I, I don't know what they mean. Nicola, do we have any, any responses? Um, not in the Q&A at the moment. I, if anybody would like to raise their hand, I can quickly unmute you. Oh, um, Usla wrote in synthesis, and Doa wrote in detail orientated. Orientated. Yes. Yeah. No. No. They're both. They're both wrong. It's, it's just one word. That actually means excavation. It's an archaeological excavation. But someone went to the extraordinary length of confusing the hell out of any, everyone by writing that nonsense. And it, it resulted in these huge, pompous tomes of, uh, of, of very heavy, almost indigestible texts that us poor archaeologists had to wade through to try and understand what on earth the author was talking about. So please do not write like this. It, it's, it's never a good idea to try and, uh, and, and be clever uh, by using um, uh, pompous writing. So avoid uh, pomposity. The next moonwalking bear is slang. Uh, and, and the most important um, piece of slang, I think, that people tend to, to start using in their writing and, and they should resist is the avoidance of contractions and abbreviations. Couldn't, wouldn't, shouldn't, won't, don't, can't, um, you know, just it, it's formal writing. So don't use contractions, don't use these abbreviations, cannot, could not, would not, is, is the way in which academic writing uh, should, uh, should be conducted. Uh, and also uh, abbreviations and acronyms, you know, try not to use those. Of course you can use an acronym, but at the first point that you use the acronym, write the whole thing out in full so that everyone knows what you're, you're writing about. And then after that, you can, you can write the acronym. But if you just wade in by peppering your writing with abbreviations, uh, people might not know what you're talking about. PM, what, what's PM? Is it prime minister? Is it post-mortem? Is it, you know, what does it mean? Okay, so avoid slang. Um, so uh, as I said, it, academic English is, is formal. It's not casual, but the division between written and spoken English is becoming blurred. Uh, so avoid over familiarity. Here are some uh, examples from my essay marking in the past, again, related to archaeology. Uh, the recovery of the ice man was a right mess, uh, is, a, is a very sort of familiar way of saying the excavation of the ice man uh, was not done in a particularly good way. But one wouldn't write it was a right mess. Binford was out of his mind in suggesting this. Actually, uh, the original was Binford was out of his tiny mind in suggesting this. Uh, Binford was an archaeologist who, who um, came up with some very radical ideas uh, about uh, how society developed, uh, many of which have been now debunked. Um, uh, and this student was trying to say, I disagree with Binford. But he didn't say that. He said Binford was out of his tiny mind. Again, it's too informal. It's over familiar. Uh, the cave art of the Upper Paleolithic was cool. Uh, yes, it was. It was, uh, but you wouldn't write that to an archaeology professor. You would say the cave art of the Upper Paleolithic was 
impressive or something like that, not, not cool. It's, um, it's blurring uh, academic English to, to be over familiar with this way. Uh, texting uh, and other forms uh, of, um, of written English, um, great as they may be, have no place in formal pieces of academic writing. So uh, don't use these sorts of texting shortcuts or laugh out loud, etc. cetera. Um, I, I don't know what most of those mean, actually. I only recognize one or two of them, which probably um, is showing my age somewhat. But um, uh, I often find in, in uh, formal communication now some of these things creeping in. Uh, and, and again, it is to be avoided. Uh, similarly, Facebook and other social media use emojis to the point that some members of society can communicate emotions such as anger and doubt and illness uh, and other ideas using just symbols, none of which have a place in academic writing. So don't use about, you know, I, I shouldn't really be having to say this uh, to a group of budding uh, academics and scholars, but uh, you will be surprised how many people uh, communicate with emojis. Uh, repetition. I mentioned this earlier. If, if someone writes something that really makes them feel good, they think they've cracked an idea. Oh, wow, that was fantastic. I'm doing loads of points for that. I will repeat it. Uh, they write it in a slightly different way. That must be avoided. Repetition. So I've just said, must be avoided. Um, repetition must be, this, this isn't a fault, I'm, I'm making a point here, that repetition must be avoided. Uh, there was a bouncing repetition there, that must be avoided. And ju just to, to give a little uh, story here, when, when I used to teach in front of hundreds of people in a lecture theatre, uh, and I'd give the same lecture over and over and over again, uh, one time I got a little bit bored at the beginning of PowerPoint and they introduced all these fantastic animations. And so I thought, I'll, I'll, I'll see how long I can keep this going. And so I had repetition, this slide going by with all of the different permutations, with all of the, I think this one should grow. There you go, that one's growing. I had them spinning around and I kept it up for 10 minutes before people started to, uh, to, to sort of protest. Uh, but I did make my point quite effectively, I think, that you shouldn't be uh, writing something and then repeating it. Because you, you'll only get points for the first time you write it down and then the uh, reader of, of your writing will get upset and say, ah, this is repetition, stop putting red lines through it. So don't uh, uh, repeat yourself. <clears throat> that would be absurd to keep going on for 10 minutes. Uh, so I, I, I have stopped, I won't have any more animations. And absurdity, in fact, is the next uh, thing that we need to avoid in our writing. So uh, what is absurdity all about? Uh, well, it's, it's saying something that you think makes sense, and then when you reread it, you think, oh my Lord, why did I write that? That's just craziness. Here are some examples. Settlements were moved to drier areas. Now, obviously, this student meant that as floods became more and more and more prevalent and as the ground became boggy, etc., uh, people started to settle on dry areas and not in the lake beds and the river beds, etc. Clearly, they didn't move their settlements lock, stock and barrel to a, a drier area. So what they've written is actually absurd. And it, 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 you get all these mental pictures often with absurdity that make you uh, chuckle. Uh, but again, uh, you don't want to be writing uh, crazy things. Here's one of my favourites from marking essay. Someone once wrote uh, on an essay on bones uh, and bone ident identification. Male horses are unlikely to become pregnant. Well, I, I can assure you, uh, I don't think there's ever been a case where a male horse has become pregnant. So that clearly is absurd. And I did say I would include um, elements of my own writing. So it, here is something that, uh, that uh, will be familiar to you all. Uh, this was a first draft 
of trying to describe what this seminar was all about. Few people are born with good writing skills, but as with most things in life, the ability to write well can be developed and nurtured. Uh, and then I thought about it for a bit and I thought, why on earth did I write that? That's just craziness. Because again, I can assure you that um, no people are born with the ability uh, to, to, to write well. You know, it, it conjures up a picture of a baby communicating with its mother, you know, and, and, and writing something like that. I'm unable to speak because I haven't learned to speak yet, um, but I've written you this poem to, to, to uh, uh, let you know how grateful I am for you uh, having given birth to me. So um, it, it looks fine on the first reading, but of course there is an element of absurdity in it. Uh, and so I, I rewrote it. Uh, and you can see the final result on the advertisement for uh, today's seminar. Just a couple of examples of uh, absurd signs. I, I like to collect absurd signs. Parking for drive through service only. It's, it's just absurd. It just doesn't make any sense. Why would you park for drive through it's, it's just nonsense. And that's another favourite of mine. Do not breathe under the water. It's possible you can't breathe. It's a crazy, absurd sign. Ambiguity is slightly different from absurdity. You can get absurdity from ambiguity, but it's a different thing altogether, um, although closely related. Ambiguity is where uh, something can be read in two completely different ways, um, sometimes several different ways, that, that leads quite often to hilarity again uh, and, and should be avoided. This is one of my favorites. Don't let the worry, don't let worries kill you, let the church help. Of course, when the pastor was carefully putting this up, he, he was reaching out to people that might be worried and contemplating suicide, et cetera, uh, to go in and talk things, their problems through the church. But of course you can read it in an ambiguous way. You know? don't, don't let worries kill you. Come in and, and, and we'll, we'll help you um, achieve your mission, as it were. It's, it's not, uh, uh, not, not a clear message at all. And there's another favorite one of mine, uh, found on a golf course in Japan. Uh, any persons except players caught collecting golf balls on this course will be prosecuted and have their balls removed. I think I think that's a bit harsh, to be honest. But there you go. It is um, uh, an example of ambiguous writing. Uh, misprints is another thing that should be uh, avoided. Um, this is this is where you think you've written the right thing, but you've you've is it, it, it's a typo really. But sometimes typos um, can be a little bit more difficult to correct, like these guys who have uh, misspelt school uh, in paint in sort of seven foot letters across the across the road. So let's um, th that that's a very quick overview of the moonwalking bears of, of bad writing, the things that we need to um, look out for when we are writing. As I said at the beginning, right away, write, write quickly and, and badly, get the ideas down, but then go through your writing in this drafting process in order to eliminate those pitfalls of, of poor writing that I just highlighted to you. And I want to turn to uh, the writing process itself and give you some uh, ideas about how we might um, um, how we might develop uh, and, and structure uh, an essay. So what, what are the elements of, uh, of a good essay, a decent essay? Well, it, it clearly should have uh, an introduction. This, this is probably a lesson that everyone has had before at school. It, it, when you're writing an essay, you need an introduction, you need a body, you need a conclusion, and then at the end, you need your references. So an introduction defines the topic, it responds to the question, and it states the main issues and abstracts the response that the writer wants to make. So you usually would write your introduction at the end, <laughs> which sounds a bit back to front, doesn't it? But you write your essay first, you, you get all of your ideas down, you thrash out your arguments, 
And then you distill the argument into a few words that go into your introduction after you defined the problem, you state your, um, uh, your exploration in, in a short uh, introduction. Then you have the main body where you're developing the arguments and using evidence from your reading to support those arguments and to critically analyze them uh, and to structure and support the points that you've made. So the body of the essay, depending on its length, will be uh, quite a number of, uh, of paragraphs taking one uh, topic and argument uh, at a time and hopefully uh, leading towards a, a resolution at the end. Uh, and that would be uh, your conclusion where you highlight the key points that you've, uh, that you've made and you relate them to the title. Uh, and a good essay will also suggest areas for uh, further research. So I'm going to look at what that might look like, what I've, what I've just distilled there in the previous slide, in, in a, a, a more concrete example. So in the red box at the top there, you can see a question. It doesn't really matter what the question is. I've just used one from uh, education development uh, because it's perhaps something that uh, we can all in some way uh, relate. Compare and contrast uh, the consequences of blindness and deafness for the language development in children. So what I'm going to do now is to just uh, very briefly look at what um, a failing essay would look like, what a mm, sort of passable essay might look like, what a, a weak essay would look like, what a good essay would look like, and what an excellent essay would look like. So we'll start with the fail. So a fail would be almost anything related to blindness and deafness in child development in no discernible order, just thrown onto the page. And also some of what this, what the failing author will have done is to also actually make some fairly serious mistakes to, to write sort of some rubbish and nonsense in there as well. So some of the stuff that they're randomly listing uh, is just not right and it's not supported. So that would be a failing essay, even if it meets the word length and you know it's uh, there are some elements of uh, of even good writing in there. If it's if it's not answering the question, it will fail. A bare pass will look like this: almost anything related to blindness and deafness in no particular order. It's very similar to the fail, but in this case, there's no gross errors in it. There's no um, sort of crazy ideas that are just completely unsupported. It's random, uh, there are lots of ideas just spilling out onto the page, it has no structure, it's just a random list of things that might be relevant. That would be a bare pass. A good response would list some features of blindness and deafness and the consequences of these for the development of language. That's a fairly decent response. A very good response would identify the consequences of blindness and deafness for language development and then compare and contrast them. Notice it's, it's doing almost exactly as what have, has been instructed in the, in the essay title. Now let's look at what an excellent sort of response would look like. An excellent response would identify the consequences of blindness and deafness for language development, compare and contrast them, and then draw conclusions about the nature of language development. A few typos there you will note as well. I didn't, I didn't prepare thoroughly enough. I should, be, I should have my wrists slapped. Uh, so it, it would uh, draw conclusions uh, and, and then, importantly, comment on the adequacies of these theories of language development in the light of conclusions. So, Moving on then to the writing process itself, uh, I've got some suggestions, some top tips on, on how you might uh, incorporate some of the elements that I've been discussing in today's webinar um, in your writing process. And I'm suggesting that you have to draft, uh, you, you have your first draft, and then you, focus, you take that first draft, and then you focus on one thing at a time. So you're gonna be doing this for quite some time, yeah, and, and hopefully after each draft, you put it down 
have a drink, go out for a walk, maybe have a sleep, look at it the next day. So it's, so it's an ongoing process. So your first, you take your first draft and then you have uh, a focus on one thing. And I'm going to give a suggestion for each focus uh, and what you would focus on in, in that draft, what, what you would actually do. So the first focus for you in your first, um, or, or rather your second drafting exercise would be to focus on words and phrases. Have you used any overly complex words where simpler ones would have done? Are you guilty of pomposity, in other words? That moonwalking bear that I mentioned earlier on that's going to devalue your writing. My suggestion is that you demonstrate the understanding of any idea or concept that might be unfamiliar to the reader in your first mention of it in the essay. What, how you would actually do this in your draft is you could go through and underline words and phrases. If you're, if you're reading through and you notice a word there, I don't actually understand what that means, then probably your reader doesn't understand what that word means. You've picked it up from somewhere, so you need to define it, or you need to replace it with a word that you do understand that isn't pompous or replace it with a word that you thought you had used properly, but you hadn't, and you're guilty of absurdity or ambiguity. And my top tip here is to always use a dictionary or a thesaurus to, to, to enrich the, uh, the, the, the words that you're working with. Um, I used to keep a, a, a booklet of words that I came across when I was reading that I didn't understand. And then I would write down alternative synonyms to make sure that I understood it. And I'm still caught out sometimes today. I'll be in a meeting and someone will use a phrase. And you think, oh, what does that mean? And you have to secretly go away and look it up and then add it to your list. So this is a lifelong process. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of thousands of words and new ones are being minted and created all the time. So you need to keep up to date with uh, dictionaries and uh, thesaurus. The next focus, so this will be now draft number three, is to focus just on the sentences. And one thing I think that mars quite a lot of, uh, of essays that are written by inexperienced students, maybe in the first year or so of their undergraduate careers, is writing, uh, they're so eager to get things down, and they, they tend to write overly long sentences. So um, my, my suggestion is, is look at, at the sentence. If it's too long, make it short. But also sometimes people write too short sentences. They're, they have to be just right. Um, uh, if you use too, too short sentences, then the ideas don't really flow. They can become fragmented. But at the opposite end of the spectrum, if your sentence is too long, then they become difficult to follow. If you have a sentence with uh, no full stops, you know, no, no pause for breath even, then uh, your, your mind in, in the reader is going to get confused. You know, sorry, what was this sentence about? It started you know, minutes ago, and I still don't understand what this sentence is about. So my suggestion in the draft is that you get a mirror and read it out loud. Read your essay out loud in front of a mirror. You want to be aiming for about 15 or 20 words per sentence. If you read it out in front of a mirror and you start going blue in the face and think, oh, I can't breathe, then your sentences are far too long. You need to break them up uh, into more manageable um, structures. Uh, and that will also make it easier for your reader to read and follow and understand uh, what you're writing about. Uh, we're on draft number four now, I think. Draft number four, you focus only on paragraphs. My suggestion is that there should only be one idea for each paragraph that you write. Ensure that the idea is explicitly stated and explained. So in the draft, you would go through and underline the main idea in each of the paragraphs that you've written. If there's more than one idea, then you know that 
it, you might be guilty of the moonwalking bear of repetition. And have I just repeated myself? Uh, if, if I have, then, you know, cut it out. Uh, if you haven't and it's a new idea, then you need to start another paragraph. So uh, that's, uh, I think, let me just press the next button. I think that's going to, I I'm hoping it's just going to say UNICAF now and I've come to the end, which hopefully will be, uh, uh, you know, not, 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 not too bad news because I'm hoping that we can have lots of questions and interaction and I can help. Oh no, there's one more top tip. Sorry guys, one more top tip. Use a dictionary, not just a spell checker because uh, a spell checker and these very clever tools that you can use still can't recognize the difference between principle and principal, practice and practice, there and there, here and here, two, 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 ascent and ascent, effect and effect, accept and accept, access and excess, burned and burnt, etc. So you do need to um, use um, a dictionary, not, not just one of these word processing spell checkers, otherwise you might end up uh, creating all sorts of problems with absurdity, uh, redundancy, ambiguity, if, if you've used the wrong word. There's some more examples there, called and called, complement, complement, dependent and dependent. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of examples of these that you need to check to make sure that you're using the right words. Now, when I press the button, it should say Unicaf.